Tom Bauer is the king of the highly revealing warts and all biography. His previous victims have included Simon Cowell, Tony Blair, Robert Maxwell, Jeremy Corbyn, Richard Branson, and now the Prime Minister Boris Johnson gets the Bauer treatment. Capaciously researched, this page turner is a much needed profile of a man who likes to roll the dice and who has the uncanny habit of prevailing against all odds. Whether it's winning two terms as London mayor in a Labour supporting city, getting Brexit done or winning a stunning 80 seat majority in December 2019 that absolutely no one saw coming. Boris Johnson has made a career and a habit out of surprising people. So has Boris got any more surprises up his sleeve? The author of Boris Johnson, The Gambler is Tom Bauer and he joins me now. Hi, Tom. Hi, good evening. Tom, by the time you'd written the book, did you like or dislike Boris Johnson? Well, I didn't dislike him as much as I disliked Jeremy Corbyn or Tony Blair or some of the other people, but I was ambivalent. I mean, I thought that he had been unfairly treated by a lot of the critics. They called him a liar, a racist, lazy, no attention to detail, a man who really couldn't do the job properly. But I discovered that as mayor of London, contrary to all the previous biographies and the normal run against him in the Times and the Guardian and elsewhere. He'd been a very good mayor. He'd done quite a lot. So I'd hoped that he would translate that success at City Hall, uh, where he picked up a city, London, which was destroyed by the 2008 financial crash. And by the time he left eight years later, it was the most popular city in the world and was booming in 2016. So I'd hoped he'd do the same when he got to Downing Street. But I fear that COVID and uh, so much else has interfered, and I'm not quite sure whether I, at the time I wrote the book, I was a bit ambivalent, and I'm just as ambivalent now. Boris clever? Sorry? Is Boris clever? Yes, of course he is. He's very intelligent. He's very canny. And he has this brilliant ability to make people think he's a fool while he is actually scheming and plotting and the rest. And uh, what we don't see at the moment is what made him so popular, which was the funny, uh, jovial clown. I mean, he's just so serious nowadays. It's hard to imagine that he ever got that epithet, the clown. Uh, and he doesn't seem to come out with great one-liners or anything. I think he's worn out, frankly. I think he's made some terrible mistakes about the people he took into Downing Street and the people he's appointed to Downing Street, because he hasn't got a great team around him. and. The job is so enormous and so demanding that unless you arrive with a cabal who you can trust and who can tell you what's right and what's wrong and all the rest of it, you make unfortunate errors. And so I think that now in September, October will be the moment that he really has to reassert and rebuild and refire and re-energize and re in the end convince those who supported him until now that he is the man they thought they had supported. So I suppose your verdict about his premiership would be that uh, we cannot actually have a view yet because of the pandemic and because of uh, perhaps a lot of internal political strife at number 10, uh, namely Dominic Cummings, of course, um, that it's, it's, it's too early to actually judge Boris Johnson as prime minister. Well, I think that he, as Prime Minister, uh, successfully, from his point of view, got Brexit through, which had defied Theresa May. Of course, he won the election. And I think as far as COVID goes, no government in the whole world has succeeded. We were all told a year ago how brilliant New Zealand and Australia are, and look what a disastrous set they've done. We were told that Germany was the ideal because of all their testing by people, pundits who said, go, we like Germany. And of course, testing has left Germany just as damaged. Um, France is a disaster as well. So what I think of COVID is that Boris, quite rightly at the beginning, he had no choice but to say, I'm going to follow the scientists. Because if he would have said, I'm not going to follow the scientists, people would have said, hang on, what are you talking about? And unfortunately, the scientists got it wrong. The advice he got was wrong. Uh, and then, of course, he was trying to find out what was the best path through it. Now, I just come to the present because I think what's very interesting is that when five, six weeks ago, 
he said he was going to relax and give us our freedom back, Keir Starmer called him reckless. Uh, Matthew Paris, one of his greatest critics, who hates Boris Johnson, said that if Boris Johnson's reckless move now proves to be right, I'll have to reconsider my views about him. Well, of course, we all think he was right now. Thank goodness yeah. he relaxed the restrictions and we're beginning to get back to normal. The schools are going back and people have drift back into their offices now more than ever. So what is really remarkable about Boris is one way is this, that when he defeats people, for example, the teaching unions, he doesn't chortle. Mm. He has a unbelievable ability to just um, not kick his, kick his defeated enemies in, uh, in the vulnerable parts and just get on with it. His misfortune is that as a great communicator, he's not communicating. His misfortune is that as a man who actually engenders great loyalty, he seems to have a lot of disloyal people and dysfunctional people in Downing Street. And whereas I thought, as your question said, is he clever? What was I always thought was clever about Boris is that he chose the right people and delegated powers to them. Mm. And that gift seems to have been denied him at the moment. And he's unwilling because of his nature to get rid of people who are letting him down, like Gavin Williamson, the education secretary. Yeah. He seems to be scared of dismissing any more people. He seems to be scared of some of the more influential and more intelligent backbenchers, like uh, Tom Tugendhat. And of course, that's no use. You can't be a successful prime minister if you have any fear. So that's what's at the moment uh, turning out to be a Boris, which I didn't expect, a man who seems to be a bit scared, uh, seems to be a bit worried, and doesn't have command of the machine. I thought he would have learned the lessons to avoid those pitfalls. Well, that's right, because we know that Mrs Thatcher leveraged her political power by hiring and firing people uh, willy-nilly, and that's, it was always the threat of the sack that kept cabinet ministers on message, wasn't it? And uh, there's a great biography about Margaret Thatcher by Hugo Young, and it's called One of Us, because she would whisper to her colleagues, you know, is that MP one of us or not? And Boris needs to build that kind of consensus around him at number 10. Well, I, that's right. But I think what's very interesting is, you see, you mentioned Hugo Young and that amazing book, One of Us, an epic book uh, at, the, at the time. And the whole political establishment now, not least the journalists, seem to be totally unaware of real politics. I, I can't find anywhere to read what is actually happening inside Downing Street. Uh, there seems to be a lack of trust between the politicians and the journalists uh, of what they're actually up to in government. Uh, except that, if you look, and if you look at the Foreign Office and this spat and this war about Afghanistan, the truth is just not being told. Uh, nobody in Fleet Street, nobody in the media is telling the real story about the failure of the Foreign Office and the Civil Service and the MOD. Uh, and I find that very sad. And I think that's part of the problem that we seem to have government in a vacuum at the moment. And I wonder whether Boris is part of that problem, Tom. He's clearly got colossal strengths. But as you said, um, he hasn't fired Gavin Williamson uh, over the exams debacle. He hasn't fired Priti Patel over the uh, illegal channel crossings. And he didn't fire Dominic Cummings uh, and, and even had the humiliation of the Rose Garden press conference. That wasn't enough to persuade the Prime Minister to let him go. And, of course, Matt Hancock caught snogging someone on CCTV. Um, what's the root of this? I mean, is... Is the Prime Minister in the absence of a backbone? Does he lack courage? Or has he got too many skeletons in the closet for him to start firing people? Well, I think you. there's a lot there. Uh, first of all, he has courage. He's a great uh, bruiser, and he really does take risks. Uh, people, uh, physically, Tom. he has great courage. He wants to be liked. Is he, is he courageous with people? I mean, he makes bold decisions like backing Brexit, calling an election, but... Can he eyeball someone and say, you're fired? No, but what he, he does it in a different way. Uh, I think that you can't, you've got to distinguish. The thing about Dominic Cummings is that he had made Boris. He made Brexit happen. He made the election happen. He was a ruthless man. And the most important service he could have done 
for Great Britain would have been to completely reform the civil service, which the whole Afghanistan saga, saga and the illegal immigrants and many other examples shows is totally unfit for purpose. And Cummings, if only he had been a normal man, could have performed an enormous, uh, uh, got a great gratitude for the country and a great task if he had reformed the civil service instead of going off in a huff. Yeah. Um, Boris, of course he should have fired Gavin Williamson. The problem is that he doesn't want another enemy on the back benches. And that is, of course, a great weakness. Mm. But the real problem is I'm not absolutely convinced anymore that Boris has a purpose, a theme. Uh, I mean, Thatcher, of course, had this great uh, theme of revolutionising Britain, rebuilding Britain. Boris is a Heseltine Tory. He wants to rebuild Britain. But he doesn't have the people and I, I think the ability to marshal those people who he could, should select to build what he wants, to build a modern Britain. And that, of course, is a, is a weakness. Now, is he exhausted? Is it because of a long COVID or something like that? Is it because his domestic arrangements aren't ideal anymore because of uh, marrying Carrie and uh, all the rest of it? He's got money problems. It's hard to understand. What actually is holding him back? Uh, the fact that he doesn't make any great speeches, the fact that he really isn't very good anymore in the House of Commons, the fact that he is only powerful because of the appalling nature of the opposition and Keir Starmer to his good fortune, Boris's good fortune, is facing such a plodding prosecutor. Uh, it's, a, it's not a great time. But on the other hand, you've always got to say to yourself, this is much, much worse. In other countries, I mean, yeah. Germany is leaderless and America clearly has problems and oh. Macron is a monster. So, you know, Boris, at least Britain is a sane and sensible country still. Well, I agree with you. And, Tom, I've said it on this programme that the Prime Minister, clearly a lockdown sceptic, he's reported to have said, let the bodies pile high, which I think is just an example of his extravagant use of language rather than his moral code. Uh, but, but, you know, he was sceptical about the, the uh, lockdown policy and the impact it would have on the economy. But he was essentially steamrolled by the sage advisers. As you said, who could argue with so-called scientific experts? And I'll definitely cut him some slack on that one. And I do think he deserves great credit for Freedom Day on the 19th of July. We're benefiting uh, from that decision, that courage to actually lift restrictions. Cases fell, hospitalizations have fallen as well. He's been vindicated. And of course, there are many people watching this program now who still love Boris, Tom. Uh, many watching this program who were previous Labour voters who backed Boris and they're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And one thing that your book teaches us is that you underestimate Boris Johnson at your peril. Well, I think that's exactly right. And I my criticisms of him are more in sorrow than in anger. Um, I think that he has been terribly let down by the civil service. I mean, only 10% of them have come back to work. Uh, I was talking to an ambassador of a major country the other day who said that in the last year, he's still spoken to nearly no one at the foreign office because they're all away. And if you go through, if you want to get your car license, uh, driving license renewed, you've got to wait for years because there's 1.8 million applications waiting. I mean, people just aren't working. And he needs to get people back into the office yeah. and the machine going. I mean, that is a, a major problem for him. Absolutely. Do you think that he wants to be Prime Minister for a long time, Tom? Yes, I do. I think that he is a hugely ambitious man. He wants there to be in history a Johnsonian era. I think that he wants to uh, carve his name for 100 years, so that people would talk about Thatcherism and Johnsonianism. Uh, his problem is at the moment, clearly the COVID has been a huge blow, and Brexit, come, overcome Brexit will be his triumph if he can manage it and get over all the dreadful problems that have arisen. He's partly helped, I think, by the, because the EU is in a terrible mess, and Brexit is more and more v seeming vindicated because Europe itself can't, go can't govern itself and all the governments of Europe. I mean, for example, in Holland, hasn't had a government since March. I mean, this is just it's extraordinary what's happening in the EU. But of course he wants to stay, and of course he wants to establish a legacy and build Britain. I mean, he is a great patriot, yeah. which is why so many people trust him. 
And no one can really think at the same time that Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner are going to do a better job than Boris Johnson. I mean, it's just it's laughable. And as for the Liberals, they want to just destroy the capitalist society. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So we're, and <laughs> on the Tory benches, there's no one who can challenge Boris at the moment. There's no alternative prime minister. So I think we're, we've got Boris for at least another five years, if not more. But he just has got to, if he wants to achieve his ambitions, he's just got to uh, change a lot of the way he operates. Um, I'll uh, touch briefly, if we can, on your book about Meghan Markle. Now, I'm conscious it hasn't been published and I don't want, of course, to uh, steal any thunder from that book and we can't wait to interview you about it when it comes out. A couple of questions about Meghan. I know that you're busy at work on the book at the moment. But just um, finally on Boris, uh, what were the formative experiences in his life that shaped the man that we now know? Well, I think there are several and that's a very interesting aspect about Boris. First of all, uh, my book revealed how his father had regularly beaten up his mother in front of him for years of abuse. And Boris saw that, and that was clearly very damaging. Secondly, that Boris, contrary to the impression, was brought up in real quite poverty. His father had no money, and his mother had even less when she divorced his father. I mean, he had an amazing education at Eton, but that was on the basis of a scholarship. So I think that that poverty has always influenced the way he regards money, and his own private life has been very much dictated by what he saw at home. I mean, he is clearly a very, very adulterous and disloyal uh, husband and lover. But on the other hand, he has great confidence in women. Um, I discovered that the mistresses of Boris have, were he really his soulmates. He needed a woman to actually confide in. And that was both his strength and, to some extent, obviously his weakness, that he needed a woman who he could lie in bed with and talk about the world. Uh, not just about politics, but about the classics, about sport, about a range of interests he's got. And Downing Street has cut him off from that. I mean, that's the sad thing for him, that he hasn't got that sort of release harem. mechanism. Tommy's lost his harem, absolutely. He can't sort of sneak off somewhere at lunchtime to a Holiday Inn Express for, um, you know, a bit of how's your father. I'm, if, on this, I've got some brilliant fewer questions, but... Do you think that marriage to Carrie, Carrie will, will help him to settle down, give him some closure, some peace? Uh, might, be, uh, might this be uh, Boris Johnson 2.0? I don't think he's looking to settle down for peace. That's not the nature of the man. I think the peace and the settling down is crippling him. He needs to be able to get out and go around the country and meet people. He loves meeting people. And he loves to be away from the office because... When he's away from the office, he sees the real country, and that's what sparks him into energy. So I think the domestic life is actually very bad for him. And frankly, I mean, if I can just give you one example, he's putting through Parliament at the moment this bill called the Animal Sentient Bill, which is all about protecting oysters and langoustine from being eaten and cooked. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, this is clearly Carrie's influence. And it's annoying a lot of Tories and annoying everybody and pleasing very, very few except the langoustine mm. who are meant to be cooked in a different way. And I, this is where it all goes wrong, um, that he just needs to be able to be exposed to the real world and he wouldn't make ridiculous uh, decisions like pursuing this bill, which is of no interest to the vast majority of people and causing a lot of political strife. The Gambler... Boris Johnson by Tom Bauer is out now. Tom, I love the book. It's such a page-turner. He is such an interesting personality. I'm uh, happy to give Boris Johnson the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we all need him to succeed as Prime Minister as we navigate our way out of the pandemic and the biggest recession in 300 years. So we wish Boris well, and uh, the book is highly recommended, Boris Johnson, The Gambler. Before you go, I know that the ink is barely dry on your latest chapter of your Meghan Markle biography. Um, some questions coming in, but please keep your powder dry. But just a, perhaps a brush stroke overview. Um, this is from Dance Like a Queen on Twitter. Based upon your research thus far, is Meghan unfairly portrayed in the British media? Uh, <laughs> well, I think the answer to that is uh, no. Um, I think that she is a woman who has... Um, 
came in with amazing, amazing goodwill. Uh, the wedding alone, everyone bowed to make her a success and to embrace her and multiculturalism and everything. And uh, what is fascinating about this story is the nature of the woman. Um, I have discovered things which are really quite surprising and surprise me. And you look at that very, very beautiful woman and you'd be surprised what goes on in the head and elsewhere. And so I think, if anything, she's had a, a honeymoon with the British press uh, when the truth um, hadn't yet come out. Uh, and there's a lot more to come out. And I fear that uh, Harry's uh, biography next year could do untold damage uh, to the royal family. And that, I think, is a, a shocking indictment of both of them who were so welcomed uh, when they married in uh, May 2018. Yes, it's, it's one thing, isn't it, to appear on a podcast or do an interview, but to, to put it in print, uh, to sit there for uh, the rest of time is, is, rather, uh, is rather damning. Uh, last one on this, Tom. Helen on GB Views asks, uh, Tom, do you think Meghan and Harry are narcissist and empath type pairing? Well, I don't know what empath type pairing is. We'll have to no, educate I'm not me quite on that. sure either. Actually, I'm. I'm apologies. Well, I think what she means is to Helen. I, I'm not sure of the lingo, no. but yeah, help me with that, Tom. <laughs> well, the thing is that she does have terrific empathy. She plays on empathy, Megan. But I think you make a great distinction between Megan and Harry. I mean, is Harry the hostage, or is he the hunk? Is he the <laughs> man who's actually leading with as the husband, or is he following as the serf? I mean, that's the question, uh, which uh, we'll only know the answer in a few years' time when, if the marriage continues. But there's no doubt that M M Meghan has an enormous love for herself and uh, she has a, an amazing ability to control. I mean, what is remarkable about Meghan is that this is a girl who was born to a broken family and not much money, but a hugely ambitious father. And she, in the end, rose to be the the Duchess of Sussex, Sussex. I mean, what an achievement. And that was very carefully plotted. Uh, she is a very, very clever, shrewd woman. And she should not be underestimated. No. There you go. Parallels between Meghan Markle and Boris Johnson. Uh, have we got a publication date yet, or is that too much pressure, Tom? Well, no, it'll be sometime early next year. It's going ahead pretty well. Really looking forward to it and uh, can't wait to welcome you to the studio to discuss it at length. Tom Bauer, thank you for joining us. Boris Johnson, the gambler, is out now. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.